following a string of summer victories, most recently at Second Manassas, in early September 1862, Confederate General Robert E. Lee seeks to maintain his hard-earned initiative. It is the first time Lee's Confederates have set foot on Union soil. Lee's march into Maryland is a bold gamble. He hopes to bring the Union Army to battle and deliver another crushing defeat on the U.S. Capitol's doorstep. But Lee's fortunes take a turn. He must divide his army to deal with the strong Union force at Harper's Ferry. To make matters worse, his opponent, General George B. McClellan, moves with unusual speed in pursuit. His confidence boosted with an intercepted copy of Lee's operational plan. McClellan pushes Lee's thin ranks in the gaps of South Mountain. Though the Southerners fall back, the fight here buys Lee time to find a battleground of his choosing. Robert E. Lee selects a strong defensive position amidst the tidy rolling German farm fields, bordering a swiftly flowing creek, the Antietam. But Lee is bluffing. His line on September 15th is a mirage, designed to buy time to gather his forces. Stonewall Jackson has taken Harper's Ferry and is marching to join him. McClellan pauses for two days in order to better understand Lee's position. He is convinced that Lee heavily outnumbers him. Yet Lee's bluff comes with heavy risk. If he is forced to retreat, there's only one escape route across the Potomac back to Virginia. On the afternoon of September 16th, McClellan decides to attack. He'll first hit Lee's left, then his right, before finishing things in the center. After forwarding troops across Antietam Creek, McClellan's first attack begins early Wednesday morning, September 17th, as the soldiers of Joe Hooker's 1st Corps march south, aiming for the Dunker Church. But Confederates occupy the high ground around it and unleash destructive artillery fire on Hooker's men to their front and right, while Stonewall Jackson's infantry engages them near Miller's Cornfield. Hooker responds with his own guns. Some call it artillery hell. The battle here quickly escalates into some of the most savage fighting of the Civil War. To the west, John Gibbon's Iron Brigade fares better. Marching through and around the cornfield, they enter the West Woods, where they withstand vicious Confederate counterattacks. By 7 a.m., Hooker is making progress in the cornfield. And Jackson's line, Lee's left flank, is under a very real threat of collapse. But just then, momentum shifts. John Bell Hood's hard-fighting division counterattacks through the cornfield and drives back Hooker, though at a frightful loss. Hooker calls for support from Major General Joseph Mansfield's 12th Corps. Mansfield advances his divisions in a formation that make them an easy target for Confederate artillery. And Mansfield is mortally wounded within minutes of entering the front lines. Yet one division of the 12th Corps manages to break through the Confederate line and reaches the Dunker Church. Before he can follow up on this initial success, General Hooker gets shot in the foot and leaves the fight. Lacking a leader to unite the 1st and 12th Corps, there is no rapid follow-through on the Union success at Dunker Church. With little sense of the rebel positions, around 9 a.m., General Edwin Sumner leads his 2nd Corps into the fight. Though his corps, three divisions strong, is nearly half the size of Lee's entire army, Sumner's columns are strung out, and he attacks with but one division. Sumner intends to turn the Confederate left flank, but it's his own that's vulnerable. 
Sumner's largest division, that of John Sedgwick, moves into the West Woods and is overwhelmed by a powerful Confederate counterattack. Sedgwick falls back with barely half of his men. Lee's left flank had been battered and bruised, but not broken. Although occasional fighting still occurs in the vicinity, by mid-morning, the battle shifts for the south toward an old sunken farm road. Of the 10 regiments of William French's division of Sumner's 2nd Corps, only three had ever been in a battle. Awaiting them are two of D.H. Hill's brigades, Rhodes Alabamians and Anderson's North Carolinians, men that had seen plenty of combat. They had taken control of an old wagon shortcut, a portion of it sunken by frequent use. Hill's veterans inflict 1,700 casualties on French's division. At 10.30, reinforcements pour in on both sides. Lee commits the last of his reserves in the vicinity to extend Hill's right, while Richardson's division arrives to reinforce French. An Alabama officer ordered to realign his regiment mistakenly shouts about face amid the battle's roar. All along the sunken road, it looks as if a general retreat has been ordered. Five regiments of Confederates begin to fall back towards Sharpsburg. Lee's center is now in grave danger of collapse. Richardson's advance is blunted by artillery from General James Longstreet at Piper Farm and further assaulted by small but ferocious counterattacks organized by D.H. Hill. Once again, Lee adeptly moves smaller units to stop McClellan's large blue tide. General Richardson is fatally wounded, and without his initiative, the Union advance grinds to yet another halt. Though 12,000 fresh men of the 6th Corps have just arrived at the front, General McClellan uses him to bolster his shattered right flank, and at the sunken road, misses an opportunity to crack Lee's line wide open. By 1.30, when the fighting ebbs here, 5,600 men lay dead or wounded in an area that becomes known as the Bloody Lane. Antietam's battle toll is 17,500 and climbing. Lee's right flank is arguably his most critical. It's the closest to his escape route home. Yet by mid-morning, he has only 3,000 to defend it. Across the creek, Ambrose Burnside's 9th Corps waits. He has been told to launch a diversionary attack on the Confederate right to draw attention away from Hooker's assault. But Burnside has been commanded to hold until given explicit orders to attack. Orders that do not reach him until 10 a.m. This two-hour delay gives Lee time to shift crucial artillery to his right flank. Burnside opts to divide his force. He sends one division under Isaac Rodman three quarters of a mile downstream to cross at Snaverly's Ford. His other divisions will be funneled across a 12-foot wide bridge. 100 feet above it stand 400 Georgians backed by 12 cannon. Burnside's men will cross the bridge at point-blank range. Crook's Union Brigade leads the first charge, but emerges 350 yards upstream and never makes the assault. At 11 a.m., Noggle's Brigade tries again, but is blasted into retreat before even reaching the bridge. At 1 p.m., another charge is made, this time by Ferrero's twin 51st. They win the bridge at last. 
Around the same time, Rodman's division gets across Antietam Creek. Fearing they are about to be flanked, the Georgians finally fall back. And for the third time today, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is on the verge of a resounding defeat. Lee is low on reserve troops, and Union artillery has begun to bombard the escape route through Sharpsburg. But Lee is once more spared by circumstance. Burnside takes two hours to get his 10,000 through the bottleneck at the bridge over Antietam Creek. He finally begins his march toward Lee's right flank at three, leaving two full brigades in reserve he intends to cut off Lee's retreat. His one mile wide attack is initially successful with one division pushing toward the Harpers Ferry Road while elements of two other brigades come to blows with D.R. Jones Confederates. Only Robert Toombs 700 man brigade is left to defend Lee's right flank. Many Confederates panic and run wild through the streets of Sharpsburg. But at 4 p.m., A.P. Hill's Light Division arrives after a forced march from Harper's Ferry. Despite their 17-mile march that day, Hill's exhausted men immediately strike Burnside's exposed left flank. Made up largely of new and inexperienced recruits, these green troops stand in high corn and barely see what hits them. A.P. Hill's timely arrival saves Lee's army. 12 hours of savage bloodshed has withered Lee's army to 30,000. Though the fighting has ended, he remains on the field till the next day, ready for battle. McClellan considers an attack, but once again pauses and allows Lee to slip back into Virginia to fight again. So who won the battle at Antietam? McClellan's army controlled the field and arguably saved the nation by driving Lee from the U.S. Capitol's doorstep. But many believe he missed a true opportunity to inflict a fatal blow on the Army of Northern Virginia. For failing to actively pursue Lee, President Lincoln permanently relieves McClellan of his command two months later. In one day, more than 3,600 men were killed. 19,000 were wounded and captured. More American dead than Pearl Harbor, D-Day, or 9-11. Shocking portraits taken by Alexander Gardner are displayed in the North, exposing the grim realities of the war to all who see them. President Lincoln uses the victory to announce the Emancipation Proclamation, turning the conflict into a war destined to change the very nature of American society. By freeing the slaves, Lincoln also signaled the intent to use African Americans as soldiers. Before the end of the war, almost 180,000 would serve their country. September 17th, 1862 remains the bloodiest single day in American history. 